Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. I apologize for the technology that kind of sometimes plays tricks on us, and uh, so I apologize for the delay, but I will try to do the very best I can. And um, this is a very interesting topic, the executive function. It's been uh, talked about a lot, uh, and particularly the one component that I'm going to be talking about, the working memory, and how do we design environmental scaffolds and supports and make child-specific interventions is very much the talked about issue these days, particularly when you're working with children who are in the early years and early elementary. So as I mentioned, there are, you know, there are three major components, and I have presented webinars previously on the other two components. This one focuses on the working memory. Um, so today in this webinar, we are going to be talking about how do we build and practice through various activities that's part of the daily routine and through activities that are specifically structured and most of the early childhood settings and in the early elementary, you have more or less structured activities that take place most of the time in one particular classroom setting. And of course, there are other things where they go into the playground and music room, maybe library, but it's all very specifically structured to focus on the children. And how can we strengthen that working memory through weaving this specific spa scaffolds and interventions through these various uh, settings, as well as in the main setting uh, through using your routines? How do we create an environment that's kind of nurturing and growth promoting uh, and the experiences that the children have uh, are growth promoting and how they are personalized for the children who may have some needs, maybe complex needs, maybe somewhat less complex needs, behavioral needs, communication needs, and maybe instructional needs uh, that focuses on communication, cognitive, and behavioral aspects uh, and needs of these children. And one of the other things is how do we try to increase that ac access and engagement for every child who is participating in the early childhood setting? And most of the time, many of the young children are in an inclusive setting. So you do have a diversity of learning needs and diversity of maybe children with uh, some at risk, some with developmental delays, some with diagnosed disabilities. So how can we make sure we provide access, we provide engagement, we, give pro we offer opportunities for these children to respond. Uh, uh, so today we will look at all the learner-specific scaffolds and adaptations to build working memory. And uh, we will also briefly look at EF, that's the executive function, and all the component elements. Just very briefly we touch on it. And then most of the focus will be on strengthening working memory. And we will all, I will share with you some tools and resources and specific techniques that you can use. And integrated within this webinar would be how do we use universal design for learning principles and the division for early childhood recommended practices as part of the routine activities. Uh oh, let me see if I can go back. And so the next one is a participant poll. I would like to find out, are you serving as a general ed teacher, special ed teacher, administrator, speech pathologist, occupational physical therapist, or other support staff? Or are you a parent and a family member? And as it happened, 
executive function is just as important for the child in the home setting, and parents can play a critical role in building up those strengths, uh, working memory, and the other two components I'll be talking about. Uh, I see there are uh, special ed teachers and administrators and speech pathologists, several of them occupational physical therapists, and other support staff. It looks like we didn't have any general education teachers uh, participating, and maybe special ed teachers can share this important information uh, with them. Okay, so the other support staff seem to be the main uh, uh, participating people. The information for this particular webinar, uh, most of it comes from my book on executive function, enhancing executive function in the early years. How do we build that environment that's growth promoting? How do we provide instruction that combines DEC recommend, DEC recommended practices, and also universal design for learning, and using a lot of scaffolds that are personalized for individual children, and how do we make adaptations so that they are ready and able to participate and succeed in the early childhood and the early elementary setting. I'm also an author of a number of other books, and you will see many of them uh, depicted on this page. Uh, one of the uh, new ones that will be coming out most probably in December is an early child childhood transition uh, thing. It will be transition for families, so it will address the IDEA and the law and how do, we, how do families transition from early intervention to preschool and preschool to kindergarten and how can professionals help and their different roles of families and professionals, administrators will be addressed in that book. And um, also another thing I would like to mention uh, is I'm doing a paraeducator training series. Of, it's a webinar series, uh, 21 hours of training. And um, I, you know you can go to the website that's on the last slide, I think. And if you're interested or if you want your paraeducators to be involved, they can uh, register for the 21 hours of webinar series. Now, let's look at executive functioning. These are the foundational building blocks. The brain grows at a very fast rate in the early years. As a matter of fact, 95% of the brain's capacity is built by age six. And these executive functioning, they, they are the most important thing in terms of the children being able to focus attention, work with information. They have, to, how do we manipulate that information in our mind? One, it's in the short-term memory. How do we filter out all the distractions? so that we can attend to what the teacher is saying, what the therapist is saying, uh, and to be able to switch gears, which is kind of cognitive flexibility, and to exercise self-control, impulse control, so that you can actively participate in all of the school activities, be ready, and have academic success. So in other words, EF, executive functioning, it is the process, the how of learning. How do we focus attention, remember the information, to be able to plan and to pull it back when we need it and apply that information. And that's what helps with the content of learning. Reading, writing, mathematics, computation, science later on, and all of that. So they need that. Children need the EFs to be able to read and write, to remember the steps in performing a task, to solve an arith arithmetic math problem, and also to be able to participate as a member of a group in a group activity, and also in the early childhood arena, how do we enter into and sustain play 
with other children, which is extremely important because later on we want the children to be able to socially connect with other children and respond appropriately and communicate appropriately with other children. At this time, it has become a very critical learning ability and learning skill. And it is important to note that children are not born with these EFs. But through experiences, through stimulating experiences, they develop that over time. That is why I mentioned earlier on that it is just as important for the educators as well as the families to nurture these so that children learn these, learn the ability or gain the ability, sorry, gain the ability to perform various academic tasks through strengthening their working memory, strengthening their cognitive flexibility, strengthening their inhibitory control, the three components of executive function. And that's also the reason why we want to maybe send even a newsletter with some activities with families can pursue at home. Uh, as I mentioned, the brain grows at a very fast pace. Um, it actually is at the fastest rate in the first 2,000 days. That's the five and a half years. The neural connection, I'm sure most of you know about it, called synapses, they develop at the rate of one million synapses per second. This is based on the information from the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard University, by the way. They have a number of resources, and that's included in the resources section of this webinar. And also the other thing, the plasticity of the brain, the brain's ability to adapt to different learning experiences, different settings, to work with different people, all that is greatest during the early years. So we want to take advantage of that. And the brain architecture, it is established early in life, and it supports lifelong learning, lifelong behavior, and the health of the child when the child becomes an adult. So I briefly mentioned about the three major categories, actually. But as I mentioned, Today's focus is on working memory. That is the ability to hold that information that you have learned and to be able to use that information and apply that information in different contexts and different learning activities. So when the teacher is reading a story and asking questions, the child is able to recall and respond after the story is finished. The ability to not just wrote count numbers, but able to count a set of objects and to be able to identify the total number in a set. And then to be able to identify two sets of objects, be able to count, remember that, and say how many they are together, all together. And then as part of this working memory, you have the child has to be able to stay focused, pay attention during group instructions so that the child is able to filter out the distractions, Anything that's happening in the classroom, people walking into the room, maybe some, another child sitting next to the child and not to reach out and touch another child. So to be able to filter out all that distraction, focus, attention on what is being taught. That is part of this ability to use working memory. And then when the teacher gives an instruction that, has, that is a multi-step instruction to be able to remember that and complete the task. One of the other components, which I have addressed in a previous webinar, it's called inhibitory control or self-control, impulse control. It is the ability to master thoughts and impulses, to be able to exercise self-regulation and not do things without thinking, to be able to Pause and think and then act. Uh, and the cognitive 
flexibility or mental flexibility is the ability to shift gears, to be able to switch from one task to another, to be able to stop a task and immediately begin another one, to go from one setting to another setting. Each one of these EF skills draws to some extent elements from the other. And the interesting thing and important thing to note is actually the statistic unit of, a, of the Department of Education. They have added measures for collecting data on EFs of young children uh, using the same three components, working memory, inhibitory control, and cognitive flexibility. That's interesting. That was designed by Miyake in 2000 as the three components. And so why do we have to focus attention? We have kind of addressed why do we have to focus and what are the benefits, but let me expand on that. A lot of research has been done in this area more recently, of course, and all of them indicate the benefits of training children and intervention in the whole area of executive function, as well as specifically in the area of working memory. When children have EF deficits compared to other cognitive skills, it begins to start showing up as early as kindergarten in children who are at risk. And this is particularly true in case of children who come from economically disadvantaged background. And EF intervention actually helps to reduce that impact, the negative impact from poverty. And also in some children, children with special needs, children with developmental delays, or children with uh, diagnosed disabilities may also have some issues that they, their um, EFs may be compromised uh, and that may show up again when they enter kindergarten. But the good news is EF is amenable to remediation. And, uh, and the, the other most interesting thing is those who have the greatest delay in EF benefit the most. And that's really good news, and that's why we need to focus attention on it. What researchers found, and this was a study looking at 8,000 children. This was a combination study uh, with the, in, in collaboration with the U.S. Department of Education, uh, Early Childhood Longitudinal Study, and they looked at children uh, from K, kindergarten through third grade, and they found that EF delays impacted their academic achievement trajectory and it started showing up from first grade to third grade. And this impacted their ability to focus attention, which is necessary for building and strengthening working memory, their ability to remember details, and other essential skills that they need to be successful in the classroom. And what they found, uh, I am quoting it here, right here, and they had odds of experiences, experiencing repeated academic difficulties if they had that EF deficit showing up in those early years. And it was 10 times greater than children without working memory deficit. So working memory is actually emerging as one of the most important. I know we, we know Generally, we understand that children with impulse control issues experience a lot of behavioral difficulties. And, but this working memory issues impact children's ability to succeed in kind of academic content areas. So this particular area, WM, working memory, seemed to be the most worrisome. And EF difficulties in children with special needs what they found that children with intellectual disabilities, they may have difficulty recalling information and also in the application and the generalization, which I think most of us are familiar with, but they need that in order to complete the task. And the good news again is with specific intervention, they can overcome some of these difficulties. And also we know that children who have attentional difficulties 
deficits or children who have developmental difficulties and EF problems impact their working memory. And students with autism spectrum disorders, children with ADHD, uh, children with emotional disturbance, they may experience, of course, difficulty with exercising self-control and also have difficulty with cognitive flexibility, that is switching gears, shifting gears, uh, adjusting to different settings. We, we, are, we are already, I'm sure, aware of that. But it will also affect their, because of their difficulty shifting gears, because of their difficulty with impulse control, it will also impact their ability to pay attention, which in fact their uh, skills in transferring information from short-term memory to long-term memory because of their difficulty focusing attention. But uh, the most fruitful option appears to be early intervention to address that. As a matter of fact, there was a program that was um, tried uh, and the, the researchers, this is called the Red Eye Program. Uh, it is the research-based developmentally uh, informed uh, study and they found that when this intervention was used, they saw some positive results at the end of preschool. But the biggest effect of this intervention showed up much later and especially for those children who had lower EFs. So now we will move on to what are those difficulties that emerge as part of these working memory issues? And what are some interventions, uh, personalized adaptations that we can provide? So what are some of the things that you may see in the classroom? Being able to attend, that's one of the first things. Being able to focus on a task, and then to be able to complete that task with minimal adult intervention, minimal adult prompting so that they can independently perform the task without needing frequent uh, reminders. Uh, the child may have difficulty sitting still the, during a story time. The child may have difficulty performing a task when they get back to their desk and finish that task. Uh, the child may have difficulty uh, participating in a group lesson. And the child, in some cases, may start wandering around in the middle of the lesson and may sometimes disturb others in the room too. And then one of the other dis problems that you may encounter is responding to questions which require a recall, something that's already been taught and they have to be able to recall and respond to the question. So it is previously learned information. And then another problem is, especially when it comes to problem solving, you want to be able to access all of the information associated with that particular concept to be able to respond. So that's kind of a complex information, and that may require a lot of reteaching. Uh, so that may show up as a working memory issue. And to be able to follow direction that requires multiple steps. They may, able to, they may be able to do, if it's a one step, when it is, you know, if you, you may say, the teacher may say, uh, go get your mat and sit down uh, for circle time, and the child may get confused and may go get the mat, and they may be waiting for the teacher to give the next direction. So this is how they may exhibit. And then to be able to, you know, you, you, so that you avoid repeating the same di direction, remembering to follow the daily routines and practices. You know, when you mention we are going to get ready for recess, and you may have some children who are ready and lining up and having their hands by their side, whereas you may have a child that requires individual redirection, and so that may show up as working memory because they are not able to follow that routine. And then tasks that require planning and prioritizing, which will accept, uh, especially show up in the first grade or maybe even, in, even as early as kindergarten, that requires working memory. So 
how do you create a nurturing, growth-promoting environment? First, you want to look at all the strengths and, of the child brings to the learning situation and also any needs and preferences and use that in order to uh, plan your lesson. Increase your understanding and knowledge of the different developmental stages, you know, not expecting a four-year-old to have certain uh, strengths. Uh, some four-year-olds may be delayed, but even those who are not significantly delayed may be still functioning much like a three-year-old. And this is all fits into the broad developmental stages, especially in the early years. And then making sure that you're using the universal design for learning principle, like providing various ways to present information so that you engage the student. And so multi-sensory elements, making sure that the distractions in the classroom are very minimal, making sure that the walls don't cause unnecessary anxiety and stress level because there is too much on the walls, and making sure you are providing every child an opportunity to respond, and you are providing different ways for the children to respond. Some verbally, and some may use an assistive technology, some may point. So you are providing a variety of opportunity to make sure that the child is attending, the child is engaged, so that the child is ready to respond. And then also, as I mentioned right at the beginning, make sure, take a look at the DEC recommended practices, and they have a variety of strategies supporting children to be able to respond, to access, and to succeed in the learning environment. So here comes um, another uh, uh, participant poll. What are you using? Are you using routinely in your classroom visual tools? Because some children do not respond very well just to verbal direction. When the verbal is paired with visual, they respond much better. Not only children with autism spectrum disorder, but children with ADHD, children, other children who may be slightly developmentally delayed. So, for example, one example would be a word wall, which I will show you a picture of later on, or a number wall that is paired with pictures. The other thing is instructional les lessons when you are beginning tapping into the prior knowledge of the student. Are you routinely doing that? Are you incorporating novelty item? Because that builds up the curiosity. The curiosity leads to higher motivation level. When you have higher motivation level, the students are more likely to attend and focus attention. Are you recruiting higher, higher levels of learner engagement? by using lots of hands-on activities, using multi-sensory activities, something like drama and role play immediately, uh, following the story or following a science lesson, or you immediately doing a kind of a little mini experiment in your classroom so that the children have that follow-up hands-on to be able to remember the concept. Are you using storytelling, not just story reading, but storytelling? And I will illustrate that later on. And then do students have multiple opportunity to practice and practice and practice using variety of multi-sensory tools, touch and smell and see and hear and all of that. So this is the shortened version of the same thing. So which ones are you using? Language and math visual tools, tapping into prior knowledge, storytelling, hands-on activities, uh, routine use of novelty, and multiple rehearsals. Looks like the winner is hands-on activities. That is absolutely wonderful because 
there is, if I were to rank, I would say that is almost at the very top. And then the next one top, of course, definitely, especially in kindergarten and first grade and the preschool setting, um, multi-sensory activities are just as important. That's kind of part of your hands-on. And one of the things that I would like to uh, point out is one of the things that you want to build in the children is how can they tap into prior knowledge so that it's easier for them to pull that information, which will improve their ability to recall. And we do that all the time uh, when we try to go back and try to remember where we left the keys. We are always pulling into uh, our prior knowledge because we are trying to build that episodic memory. So that's something that will definitely help children. So it's wonderful that many of you are using many of the things, but I will also expand on those that are not that intensely used, like the use of novelty and storytelling and role play. Um, so this is kind of the graphic organizer that you are thinking of when you are trying to build your children's um, working memory. Do tap, begin with tapping into prior knowledge, provide visual tools, lots of practice, and make sure that learning is truly joyful. Because when children experience that kind of joy, which comes with novelty. I was doing, uh, we had a conference for our nonprofit on Saturday. We had families and their children. You know, a simple thing, a little musical instrument that I used attracted so much interest in the children. These were, of course, slightly older children, but there were some five-year-olds and there were some 10-year-olds. But this musical toy or musical instrument, it's called a stir xylophone, S-T-I-R, xylophone. And uh, it's available at West Music and it's also available at Amazon. But that novelty attracted so much attention. At the end, I was touched when an eight-year-old came to me and asked me, uh, along you know, with his mother uh, standing, where can we get it? Can you actually write the name of this instrument on my notebook? So when you introduce something novelty, the attention is very much heightened, which enables the children to pay attention. The other thing that I would like to mention, which I don't see much of in many of the classrooms, is playing games. Um, and what playing games does, it exercises working memory. It, uh, again, just like novelty, it increases the motivation level. The children don't think they are working. They think they are playing. And this is true for all of us. That's why this great attraction to our devices. We are constantly wanting to have video games. Children want to have video games. And we want to be constantly, because we think of that device as a toy. And so what games do, they provide a rehearsal of what they have learned. So you can play mental math games, you can play vocabulary game, you can play, for example, uh, later on, I will have a story that kind of expands on that, which is, let's say you're playing, you, are li you have just read the story of Brown Bear, Brown Bear. And then you can play a game right after that saying, uh, I am going to the farm, I am going to be seeing a cow. And then the children can build on it, I'm going to the farm, I'm going to see a cow, and I'm going to see, and they can go on adding to that. That will kind of like a game, vocabulary game. They are building on it. They have to remember what the previous person said. And this is really building on their vocabulary, building on their attention skill, building on their listening skills. Uh, and games sometimes require fast responses because you are thinking, oh, the other person is waiting. And it also requires kind of decision-making in children. So try to embed 
into your routine, playing games and, of course, modeling. And also try to see if you can connect with some positive experiences that the children had with either a story or a role play or playing a game so that that boosts their positive hormones, the positive feeling, so reducing their stress and anxiety levels. So how, as I think I mentioned most of these things already, making learning joyful and motivating to increase, sustain, increase and sustain attention. And a couple of things I would like to mention is throughout your story reading or science lesson or a math lesson, see how much of it can you make it a back and forth conversation and an interactive experience. Um, incorporate, tell me, show me, model for me, watch me deliver, give me feedback. This is what you are doing all of the time. Imagine that the children are asking you to do that. And I already mentioned multiple re rehearsal and um, past learning experiences, but I would like to emphasize how can you make it culturally responsive so that children come to your classroom with sort of different types of cultural home experiences. There is all that diversity. And how can you use that to enrich your lessons? For example, yesterday for the Indian culture, that is the people from India, there was an interesting festival called the Festival of Lights. And you can, how can we connect with that, the festivals, different festivals and different types of clothing and things that immediately is visible to the children. And as I mentioned earlier, what are some visual tools? One of the things that I would highly recommend using visual tools when you're presenting a story a concept map, a story map organizer. And these days there are a lot of apps also, apps that are available, or you can have a simple story map organizer. Um, and try to connect your abstract concepts with this kind of visual presentation tool. And uh, for example, you can have a word wall and you have done, let's say, the story of the brown bear, brown bear, and some of your children in your classroom still struggling with remembering colors. Can you add a concrete object? Can you add a picture that connect with those? But not necessarily from the same book so that you are expanding their knowledge that there can be a yellow banana and sometimes, of course, green banana too, and a green leaf, and maybe you can even get the children involved in searching for some of these things, and they can bring it back to the classroom. They can go do a search during research and bring it back for different colors, and you can assign a color to the child. That makes that hands-on activity continuing, and for those children struggling with colors, it's an added uh, motivation for them to remember and to be able to recall. Uh, this is the story map organizer that I talked about when you're presenting a concept map. They can use this and you can put some foam pictures, felt pictures, or just, uh, um, you know, just a text paired with a photo. Um, so this is the one with foam pictures and uh, you can also add concrete props, and try as much as possible verbal presentation with visual elements. One of the other things that I would like to see happen, especially it's wonderful, especially if it happens in preschool, kindergarten, and first grade. How do we do role play? How do we do kind of a little bit of a drama? Let's say you are doing the story of um, Caps for Sale, which is one of the stories that I mentioned in the recommended book list. And in this story, the cap seller is selling different colored caps. And then, of course, he is resting in the afternoon, and the monkeys take away the caps. And he's struggling to get the caps back. 
So it can be a problem-solving situation. You can also present it, but you can also later on do it as a role play and have the children pretend to be monkeys and one child, or the teacher pretends to be the cap seller, and then the children imitate the actions of the uh, cap seller, which adds a fun, pure, joyful element to that story. And that could be just five, ten minutes after that story, but they will never and then you can get the children to sit down and say, what are some things that the, the cap seller could have done to get the caps back? So it kind of gets them into the next complex thinking problem solving stage. And one of the things that I already mentioned about playing games, playing games increases motivation. So what are something mental math games? As you, each day, one child who has difficulty maybe with counting can count the total number of children at the snack table, total number of children who are on the jungle gym or on the, using the swings. So, uh, you know, you can combine play with kind of counting. And you can also say patterns, like you can count two, four, six, eight as you are walking to the playground. So that's another opportunity for rehearsal. Uh, and remembering a sequence in order. And um, I think I mentioned already a vocabulary game like we are visiting the farm, what animals we see, and building on that. And uh, one of the things that I like to, and I have mentioned in great detail in my book, is how do we incorporate not just story reading and story sharing, but storytelling. So in other words, you start a story, let's say the story is brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? And so you, you can start off saying, you know, I went to the zoo and I saw a bear and there were many other animals in the zoo too. And you can have a student adding maybe names of animals or something he ate at the zoo or he went in the morning and then another child adds something about the zoo. And then you can say, you know, you can write it as the children are saying and each child adds a little bit to that story. And they take turns building that story. And it doesn't have to be this particular one. It can be any other story that you have just read, or it can be something that they are recalling from a story. That they, you know, for it can be even something that many kindergarten teachers use maybe, or preschool teacher, chicka chicka boom boom. And then they can say, Okay, there was the letter A and B and C was climbing on the tree. And then you can have another child say, oh, D climbed on the tree too. And then another child can say, E, F, G, tried to climb on the tree and fell down. So you can demonstrate it in the beginning and then children can learn that kind of strategy and it will build recall, it will build taking turns, it will build that cognitive flexibility to wait for another child to respond. So, and most importantly, this activity of storytelling will build their attention and build their recall because they have to remember what the previous person said and build on that. So storytelling, group storytelling, role play, drama, and one of the other things that builds into recall, builds into attention, is trying to weave throughout the day some kind of movement activity because after all, memory is stored throughout the body and through what is called peptides and it makes sure you integrate some music and movement activities as part of your routine. And um, tapping into prior knowledge, we talked about that, but when you are asking question, how do we provide personalized scaffolds for all children to participate? Let's say you're asking questions. You may ask a lower complexity level question to one and a higher complexity level question to another. 
so that you may ask a simple recall question to one and to another child you may ask a kind of a problem solving question. Have you seen a bear? Maybe a yes or no question. And a little bit more complex, what animals would you see at the zoo? And even more complex, they have to think, can you have a certain animal as a pet? Can you have a bear as a pet? Or something as simple as, do you have a dog at home? So draw out their memory. Challenge that memory. And in some cases, you may have to point to the picture of the bear so that the child is able to make connect. Ultimately, you want every child to feel successful that they have participated so that it will invite them, it will motivate them to participate and not be hesitant in responding. Let's say we have a child who forgets easily. This child experiences difficulty even recalling simple information like the days of the week that follow each other. And even answering question, what animal did you see just, just now? What animal did I show? And let's say you had so, shown the picture of the blue horse from the brown bear story and the child is not able to recall. Try what are some things you can provide a kind of a verbal, verbal cue or slightly open that page and then quickly close it. Or you provide a sufficient amount of wait time before you start prompting. And think about when we read the story last time, do you remember? What did the brown bear see? And then try to build the child's memory in different situations. And what other thing that's called invisible support. What is invisible support? You ask that question to a child who usually knows the answers and who comes up with the correct response, and then immediately ask the child who struggles that same question. He has just heard that answer, so he is able to remember that immediately and to be able to respond. And then slowly it builds the confidence in that child to be able to pay attention, to, to be able to respond, and to venture out a response. A lot of factors play into children wanting to respond. And we want to pull that information as much as possible and give. And certainly for a child who does not use verbal communication, we can provide the opportunity to point to a picture or use an assistive technology to it. And immediately, I like the way you tried. The child didn't give the correct answer, but the child tried. So these are all some tools that we can use, adapted tools, so that the visuals and the concrete representation enhance the child's ability to recall. And we have another child here, student S. The child has cerebral palsy and significant communication and motor difficulties, which kind of, in a way, inhibit this child's active participation. But she's friendly. She always has a smile. And she doesn't speak using verbal communication, but uses a few gestures. Let's think of those as her strength and build her attention span and her ability to recall. What are some things that will help? Using concrete items, definitely. And then one of the things, when you're working with this child one-on-one, -on -one, use systematic instruction with prompt fading procedures. In other words, when you are teaching, when the child has to be prompted for the response, do not reinforce that prompted response with a good job. Because then the child thinks, OK, I'll wait for that prompt each time because I am rewarded with a good job. So when the child makes an error, say, no, that is not three. That let's count together, one, two, three, 
four, five, six. That's six. And then now you count. So in other words, it's important that we use systematic in instruction and then initially intensive prompt gradually fading those prompts. And I already talked about reducing the complexity level of the question so that we make it easier for the child at a lower complexity level by asking simple recall questions or providing some kind of a yes or no question may be paired with a visual cue. And multiple opportunities for rehearsal and adapted tools and hands-on activities, and then pairing it with assistive technology. Some of the other motor tools are also illustrated here for that child who has motor difficulties so that the child can, you can insert that picture inside that grasp. Uh, you can attach, uh, like a bean bag is attached, on a Velcro-backed glove. You, there is a musical instrument, kind of a shaker, that is attached to a Velcro-backed glove. Uh, so there are different ways the child's motivation increases and the child's eagerness to participate instead of completely physically manipulating the child's hand. And here is a page turner that's that. So it's with a paper clip fastened to packing foam material so that the child can maybe use the whole hand to move the page. Some other uh, response participation tools, yes, no response, happy, sad, uh, yes, uh, using communication device like the I talk to communicator, uh, and then on the picture with the green bells, that is in addition to the foam numbers, you also have mini bells attached to a little plastic bag, and this is particularly valuable for children who have visual impairment so that they can hear it. And some of the book recommendations that are great for building working memory, recall, problem solving, and of course, one of the things we want to encourage and build and strengthen is that critical thinking. And many of these stories, if you give a mouse a cookie, brown bear, brown bear is kind of mainly attention and recall, but you can expand on it too. And I already mentioned about caps for sale. That's a good one for problem solving activity and great one for drama and role play. And the very hungry caterpillar is a fantastic story for recall. What did the caterpillar eat on Wednesday to can you point to something that the caterpillar ate on Monday? What happened on when the caterpillar ate so many things? And to the life cycle. Can they put it in the sequence? Can they organize? I mean, these multiple opportunities, and then they have to remember the sequence. That's again a recall. What happens to a little egg, and how does it become a butterfly? So then they are, for a child who has difficulty with recall, then the seeing the pictures and touching and feeling any felt shapes that you can use would help building that memory. Another one is the seven blind mice, and then the doorbell rang, which is an absolutely sweet story. It's both problem solving and then math, and then are they going to have enough cookies, critical thinking, and then one more, one more. So it's, it's a great story for strengthening working memory. There are other stories still. And then here I have listed some apps that you may be able to use. And then, as I said, there is also the inspiration software uh, that you can use for your graphic organizers. Um, so again, as we close, make sure your learner engagement level is at a high level for every child. For the child who has difficulty sitting, maybe the child can hold a prop for the story and be next to you. And that adds 
a kind of a higher level of motivation for that child to focus attention and to respond appropriately and also to demonstrate appropriate behaviors. Build on that, pull that prior knowledge before you begin that story or before you begin that lesson. And hands-on activities most of you are already doing. Novelty, novelty, and novelty. When you use concrete representation, when you use like bells for counting, you are adding to that novelty. When you use a musical instrument, when you use kind of movement activity, when you have finished an activity and before you transition to another youth, or you spread a large sheet of paper on the table and they work together as a group, drawing, writing, uh, sticking things, then you are adding to that novelty. So all of this and multiple opportunities for rehearsal and providing task-specific feedback, all of this help to build a growth mindset. And a growth mindset is one that helps with increasing and strengthening that working memory. One of the other things that I would like to mention before I close this page, close this particular slide, is we want to watch out for those visual distractors in the classroom. We want to minimize those visual distractors. There is a great deal of research showing visual distractors actually prevent those it impede children, especially those who have cognitive difficulties and children with cognitive flexibility issues and children with autism spectrum disorder to be able to focus attention. It, the too many visual causes visual overlaid, over, sorry, visual overload for some of the children. And these are all the references and the resources that are included and uh, lots and lots of resources. I want to thank AbleNet University for uh, this webinar, for presenting, hosting the webinar. Again, I apologize to you all for the technical difficulties that we experienced earlier. And uh, thank you for joining this webinar despite initial problems. The next webinar will focus on mindfulness, yoga, and breathing practices so that children learn calming techniques and kind of, in a way, linked to executive function because attention control is critical for learning and for strengthening that executive function. And so the next one will focus on the mindfulness, yoga, and breathing practices. And I also want to mention about the paraeducator professional training that I'm doing. It's a 21 hours of training, and it is offered by the company called ED311, ED311 in Austin, Texas. I am presenting the webinar series for this company. Again, thank you.